Thank you very much. Your Excellencies all, you must forgive me if I'm a little emotional this morning because this represents a very special moment, not just for me, but for those of us who, not due to anything that we did, but who were carried from this place to another place. And yes, there were those who came and worked in the early days of the independence of this nation. You only need to see the road named in tribute to George Padmore to appreciate the significance of the efforts of unity that came before us. In my own country, the first governor of the Central Bank of Barbados, Dr. Courtney Blackman, Sir Courtney Blackman, and our revered poet of international repute, Kamau Brathwit, both spent time in this great country teaching and learning how to live. But today we come conscious, therefore, that we were not the first to make this journey of Pan-Africanism. And that there has been a century of effort. I start here because in a world that is so clued in on instantaneous gratification, that it is important to set context and to understand the mission ahead of us. And that is why this morning is special. The context as so appropriately enunciated by the fathers of this institution that without the ability to bring prosperity to our people, we will not succeed. And that that prosperity comes through growth and growth comes through enhanced trade and opportunities for ordinary people. Perspective, because we live in a world where the existential crises threaten our individual and collective demise such that if we don't come together to stay together, we cannot survive the battles of this century. I want at the outset to salute and thank Professor Benedict Orama, who is an outstanding visionary and who appreciated that Africa's reach must not simply be that on the continent, but that the tangible expression of integrating the daughters and sons of Africa from the diaspora, and in this particular instance, the Caribbean, is a critical part of the journey of being able to forge a clear and definite future of prosperity for our people. And Professor, you have a talented and committed team. And ever since our encounter in 2021, We've seen the example of that commitment in the Caribbean in tangible ways by the urgency with which they and you have undertaken this mission. Perspective, because as chairman of CARICOM in 2020, when the COVID outbreak hit us, I received a call from Dr. Tedros who said to me, speak the strive Masiwa, the Caribbean must not flounder with its capacity to respond to this pandemic. And the people of Africa, the heads of government and heads of state of Africa have come together 
to establish the African Medical Supplies Platform. It will pool the procurement to guarantee access because we were told that our orders were simply too small to make a difference, too small to access from equipment to therapeutics to vaccines, too small to be seen, too small to be heard, too small to be felt. And that that platform, for those who may have difficulties, the financing would be available from Afrixim Bank. That was the first encounter. You heard from President Okufuado earlier the importance of friendship and the dire importance of friends in need. We, therefore, today are simply seeking to build upon that engagement which started in 2020 and which could so easily have been left as an isolated experience were it not for the vision and commitment of Professor Arama and the determination. His was a determination that if we are to truly realize our potential, then we must do as others have done. We must go afar. We may not colonize in the way that they have, but we will influence in the way that we must. And we will influence because we understand that we still regrettably fight the battles to remove an imperial shadow over the modern transactions and engagements of the 21st century. That imperial shadow has meant that the things that we were told could not be done have been done by others. That there should be no quantitative reason, but yet in the middle of the pandemic, the G7 countries engage with a level of quantitative easing that even surpassed what they did when the financial crisis broke in 2008-9. We were told that there should be no export restrictions, but we saw equipment held back and export restrictions applied when ventilators were in short supply, when it was the belief that ventilators were the savior for those who needed to survive the pandemic. We were told, as we have been for years, that there should be no subsidies and policies to give ourselves preferential advantage in a world that has been liberalized for trade. But yet we see the consequences of the Inflation Reduction Act today as we speak on the other trading partners of the globe. I say these things because if we are truly to unite and to bring prosperity to our people, a number of things matter. One, we must come together first and foremost to create the environment within which our governments and our people can most be successful. And that means reframing the agreements that were made when we were not seen as sovereign nations and when justifiably they could say that they did not know of our circumstances because we did not have the expression of nationhood when the Bretton Woods institutions were formed. Similarly, we can say to them now that almost eight decades later, there is no excuse for not seeing us, hearing us, or feeling us. And there is no excuse for others being proxies for our voices in circumstances where we do not have a seat at the table. But I come from a small little nation who also produced a woman called Shirley Chisholm, who in her attempt to remain unbought and unbossed not only was the first African 
descendant to become a female member of the Congress of the United States of America in 1968, but she dared to also run for the presidency of that country and to articulate a vision that is as relevant today, 50 years later, as it was when she went on that occasion. And she told us that if there is no seat at the table, bring your own chair. So you will better understand why we are not prepared to accept things as they are and work together to shape things as they must be. But when we finish, or as we keep doing that, it is the political will that first and foremost makes the difference to whether we are prepared to rise to the occasion and to overcome the challenges that hitherto have been placed before us. And I refer not now yet to the existential challenges, but to the challenges that were foisted upon us by colonialism and division, by language, by religion, by those who understood that as long as we could be divided, the dominance of those of a lesser number could preside. I say to us today that we know the power of unity. And it cannot simply be in the rhetoric. It needs to be in our actions and in our policies. There must be a Blue Ribbon Commission established between the African Union and the Caribbean community to put to rest once and for all the issues of connectivity. Connectivity of transport, but equally connectivity of telecommunications. We cannot be talking about innovation. We cannot be talking about prosperity and only prepared to look north rather than to look east or west. The only people who can be blamed for the absence of that connectivity now are no longer those who colonized us, but those who are in the seat today to make the difference by securing that connectivity. And I therefore look forward to my brothers and sisters coming together, recognizing that while each of us may not have the capacity to do all that we would like to do, we have the ability to pool together to secure that advantage. The Africa Exim Bank, the Africa Development Bank, the Caribbean Development Bank, the CARICOM Development Fund have a duty to work with us all, to ensure that whatever is necessary to make both the financial and economic case of connectivity is put in place. Because the next major step of cementing this relationship is not about leaders coming and mixing with other leaders, but it is about ordinary people moving in their own time and space to be able to make those friends, to make new family, and to make new business. When that happens, we will not even know the bounty that shall be created. Because there is an organic nature in which the creativity and the abundance of our people shall allow for things to happen and to be created that we can't even contemplate today. But separate from that, there is the issue of functional cooperation. And the functional cooperation, as we are seeing, with the commitment of CARICOM, 
to be able to participate through our central bank governors in the payment system, payment and settlement system, perhaps recognizing that if we use that same system, we can minimize the extent to which trading in hard currency can limit the opportunities for our people, even within the Caribbean region, even within the African Union, but more importantly, across the Atlantic Ocean with each other. The functional cooperation, however, must go beyond that. And it must now also, as it did in the area of the African Medical Supplies Platform, continue where pooled procurement is critical, both to access difficult provisions or equipment, where our orders, as I said, are simply too small, and to guarantee better pricing that we cannot do as market takers and not as market shapers. That pooled procurement, particularly in a world bedeviled by a climate crisis, relates to the extent to which we can make the investments in a few critical areas. Yes, one is pharmaceuticals. There is need for pooled procurement in pharmaceuticals, but there is also need for manufacturing of pharmaceuticals in the global south, as Rwanda has shown so brilliantly here on the continent with the establishment of its partnership with BioNTech and other African countries are about to follow. In our own region, Barbados and Guyana have also indicated that we will work together with Rwanda and the WHO and other partners in the European Investment Bank and the European Union for both technology transfer, for the provision of the regulatory framework being adopted, and for ultimately the access to have the capital. But what matters for this to happen is for us to be able to have the pooled procurement. We spoke earlier, I think Professor Rama was the one who showed us the possibilities of what can happen when Zambia makes electric vehicle batteries or when other countries are involved in medical devices. We have through functional cooperation to determine what are the centers of excellence in terms of industrial production that can bind us together as a Caribbean and African people. Similarly, my dear brother, Prime Minister of Bahamas and Chairman of CARICOM has spoken eloquently about the possibilities of services. What we can bring to the table and what you can bring to the table in terms of tourism services, like Bahamas, Barbados has in excess of a century's experience in the business of tourism. By the same token, in the area of educational and medical services, we have been able to excel such that we have been able to provide for our people a quality of life for the most part that is among the envy of the world as a developing nation. It is not rocket science. It is not impossible. And in the same way we had citizens come here 70 years ago to teach there must be ways in which there can be greater collaboration with respect to education and with respect to medical services as we are seeking to do with the African Zimbank with financial services. Bahamas has been an exemplar like Barbados, like Jamaica, like St. Vincent and the Grenadines, like St. Lucia, like Grenada, Antigua, St. Kitts and Nevis, all of us know what it is to earn our living through being hospitable and providing opportunities for others to visit. We have among global tourism the highest repeat visitor rate. It is not impossible, therefore, for us to have a more structured approach, not just to land-based tourism, but to cruise tourism. Africa and the Gulf states have the lowest penetration with respect to cruise tourism globally. And I hope that through our cooperation with Africa Zimbabwe, 
We can see individual projects from the St. Vincent and the Grenadines, which I call God's place on earth. When you go to the Grenadines and you see the beauty of the landscape to other parts of the Caribbean, where in the case of Barbados, we currently home port cruise ships and take people from the United Kingdom every week in the winter season to cruise the Caribbean. And when you ask those in Africa, why aren't we seeing more people? There is a problem of the transit visas in the North Atlantic countries. If we allow the denial of visas to our people in the North Atlantic countries to define how we can trade, then we truly deserve whatever comes to us. It is within our power to build those bridges, to stop our people from being the victims deliberately or by accident of the actions of others. In the area of services, the innovation continues. Many people in this room would never have heard of something called Archie, have you? Archie, as it then was, was the first internet search engine tool. And Archie was an innovation of a young Barbadian, Alan Emptage. You didn't know that. And he refused to patent his revolutionary technology to ensure that the modern technologies we use today could be done and could be built. He is now recognized for his creation. So that when we speak about Google, we need to know that long before Google, there was Archie. Now there are some who might have said that he was foolish and he should have patented and done what all the others did. But equally, long before Apple Pay, there was M-Pesa. And we begin to ask ourselves, how best can we work together to ensure that that innovation which we have seen, which is not gone, but still resides very much in the bosom of our people, how can it be nurtured? And how can it be used in the interests of our people? I believe that the Africa Zim Bank, along with the other financial institutions, have a role to play in that. But more often than not, we have so much distance to go in bridging the development deficit that we tend to focus only on those traditional areas rather than appreciating the importance of equal attention to unleashing the innovation of our ordinary people in Africa and the Caribbean. I believe, therefore, that we have a duty to have the cultural confidence that is necessary to believe in our people and to put the institutions there from which they can benefit. And this is where the romanticism that binds us together meets the rubber on the road with the practicality of the institutions necessary to integrate into a global economy. The Africa Exim Bank over its 30 years has shown that it is not just a romantic ideal for Africans, but it has done the business of being able to bring together opportunities for people and companies, particularly when they are most needed. I look forward to the CARICOM Development Fund, who has just become a shareholder of the Africa Exim Bank. <clears throat> Being able to meet the true needs of the revised Treaty of Shagaramas, which established the Caribbean community 
The Treaty of Shagaramas, which established the Caribbean community, and the Revised Treaty, which established the single market and single economy. In that Revised Treaty, Prime Minister Gonzalez, my dear brother, an elder statesman of the Caribbean civilization, speaks often about the fact that in a single market there are winners and there are losers. And one of the great geniuses of that arrangement we created was the fact that it recognizes that disadvantaged countries, disadvantaged sectors, and disadvantaged regions must not be forgotten. The CARICOM Development Fund, therefore, was the mechanism that was established to level the development that was necessary for all to benefit from our own free trade area in the Caribbean community. Its capacity to do so has been limited in the past by the contributions of small countries, its members. This opportunity as a shareholder of the Africa Zimbabwe, excites us as to the possibilities of finding mechanisms to unlock the significant savings base of the Caribbean community such that we can put financial instruments that are innovative to allow our own people to help finance our own development rather than simply waiting for others to bring money to help us. I am not sure that others will appreciate the significance of this moment. But while we fight among ourselves to raise 200 million, we can seek to go after some of those savings. And if we just get 1% of what is available in our banking system, both through financial and non-financial deposits, that will be in excess of a billion US dollars. What is missing was the courage of an institution to work with us to unlock these savings. This is why this is an emotional moment for me and my colleagues today. We have come to Accra, Ghana, not because we have simply come home to celebrate the homeland, but we have come to Accra, Ghana, confident that the things we shall do here and the agreements we shall make here are part of a continuum that we have started in the last year with the Africa Zimbabwe to be able to see how truly we can make a defining difference to the lives of our people. These things will not happen by accident. And when we spoke of the first Africa Trade, Caribbean Trade Investment Forum a year ago, others didn't believe that it would be possible. And yet we met in Barbados at the end of August, early September, to host that first Trade and Investment Forum. I look forward to when we will meet later this year in Guyana to do the same, because it is the bridges that we are building that will create the opportunities that our people need. You know, when we saw the holograph, and we, especially for me, who was not born until 1965, could sit in a room with the father of the post-independence world of Africa and the Caribbean. And hear the voice and the words of Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, it was also a special moment. His commitment and his life's journey is a lesson for us all on this journey. That even those who were revered have the capacity to be distracted and taken down by those whose vision is too narrow and too limited. But that ultimately, the noble causes that we fight for will always rise because they are universal and they are perennial. I leave therefore this morning, this stage, confident 
that that which has brought us to Accra is a noble and veritable cause. It was expressed by Bob Marley in that great song, Africa Unite, as we're moving right out of Babylon and we're moving into the fatherland, or should I say, the motherland. My friends, my friends, this conference is not just simply about words. The genius of this conference is that it has been about action. Let us all to the occasion now apply the will that is necessary to close the gap and to recognize from the example of Dr. Nkrumah's life that it is not always a straight line, but that we shall always remain focused because that cause for which we fight is a necessary and a just cause for the liberation and for the improvement of the lives of the people of Africa, wherever the people of Africa are found on the planet Earth. Thank you and God bless. <laughs>